second talk. Tēnā koto katoa. Nā mihi nui ki nā mana whenua o tēnei roe. Nā rātu te mana, nā rātu te whenua, he mihi mahana motu rātu manaki. Ko nā alps te pae maunga, ko iza te awa, ko waka rere rere rangi ao te aroa te waka. Nō tia mana aho, e noho ana o ki te whanganui atara. Ko Martin Toku Ingoa, ki ora katoa. I'd like to begin this presentation with a big thank you. Thank you to my wife, Penelope, for enabling me to be here. Thank you to all of your partners for enabling you to be here and your companies. And thank you all for being here. Because I'm very honored to be standing in front of you here today to talk about the future of work. This is a part of a larger discussion about Industry 4.0, but given the existential twists that jobs have on our lives and the impending changes, I will focus just on that. Industry 4.0 is the fourth industrial revolution, following mechanization, electrification, and digitalization. According to Wikipedia, it's all about cyber-physical systems. And because I'm pretty sure that everyone here knows what cyber-physical systems are precisely, I will refrain from further defining that. Contrary to the previous three industrial rev revolutions, we are blessed nowadays that this fourth industrial revolution is being accompanied by live commenting on social media. <laughs> so in preparation of this talk, I went through everything anyone has ever said or written about Industry 4.0, and I'm very pleased to give you the following summary. Industry 4.0 will be over when, thanks to AI, big data, and cloud computing, humans will no longer be needed to spin Earth, we can all just bide our time doing fun things, and universal base income will take care of our living standards. Sweet ass. <laughs> it sure sounds good, doesn't it? But of course, it's not all that simple. Let me start, for instance, with universal base income. I'm going to say three things. It's complicated. Blockchain will solve this. <laughs> and this is not the subject of my talk. <laughs> Neither the subject of my talk are the ethical considerations of AI. But you can refer to Jack's talk yesterday where he touched a little bit about the dark side of deep learning, if you're interested in that. And I'm also not going to be talking about war machines, even though that is the one field where I'd say all of our jobs need to be replaced by robots. But then we'd still be at war, so no. Instead, let's do buzzword galore. OK, OK, not galore, but I won't be able to spare you some of the buzzwords. For instance, robots. You know, those human-engineered artificial creatures that are set to one day take over the world along with all of our jobs. Meet Big Dog. That's a robot commissioned for the military. <laughs> So unless you've been hiding under a rock, there's a bit of a robot hype going on. And among the reasons for this is a revival of artificial intelligence research and machine learning applications, as we're coming out of a period that is called, or was called, the AI winter. See, since the beginning of AI research in the 1950s, <laughs> robots playing soccer by the year of 2000 was regarded the holy grail. And when it became obvious that that goal wasn't going to be reached, <laughs> the field went into a little bit of a hibernation. <laughs> but as of late, AI and robots have crept into everyday life thanks to massive progresses, progress made in the domain of machine learning. And it's really hard to deny the utility or not to be in awe of some of their capabilities. Robots can fly. Machine learning algorithms know that you're pregnant before you do. Automation is changing our lives as we look into a future of ever smarter digital assistants and self-driving cars. 
The rapid advancements made over the past decade have given grounds for many questions that are now being asked by the media and the wider public. Some of these questions are outright silly. And other questions don't seem like they will ever be answered. How will it be in the future when we actually live with robots? Do they have feelings? Can robots hurt us? Will they really understand me? Will they take care of me when I'm old? Will they take our jobs away? Can they see? It? Can they smell? Will it be scary to interact with them? Can I feel love for a robot? Will they take our jobs away? So the title of my talk is The Robot Won't Take Away Our Jobs. And while I'm pretty adamant that this is true, otherwise I'd be very foolish standing in front of you here today claiming that, I certainly do not want to give the impression that these cyber-physical systems won't have any effect on the future of our lives and our jobs. But I'm going to attempt to build the case that I believe that the changes this fourth industrial revolution are going to bring are actually going to be a lot smaller and a lot more nuanced than the changes of the previous revolutions. And that we as a society can actually stand to benefit from machines if we do things right. But let me first take you on a roller coaster ride through the last 50 plus years of artificial intelligence research. At the turn of the millennium, I obtained a Bachelor in Artificial Intelligence in the US. It wasn't an official program title. We custom designed it. I gave it the working title, Artificial Intelligence. It was a bespoke combination of the following five subjects. Computer science, psychology, cognitive science, neurobiology, and linguistics. I started out studying a field that's called classical AI. And this can be broadly described as the computer metaphor of artificial intelligence. A system takes input processes the input, and generates output. You will probably have heard of artificial neural networks. Let's take a closer look at those. Here you have a very simple neural network, three layers, an input, a hidden, and an output layer. And basically, it's a directed graph. Nodes are called neurons. The edges are termed weights. And they are often, but not necessarily, arranged in layers. A network is trained through the modification of these weights using a training algorithm so as to reduce the geometrical distance between the desired result and the actual result. Jack touched upon this in his talk yesterday, so please refer to that for the details. This is a lovely chart giving you an overview of the most popular topologies of artificial neural networks. You can see that not all of them have layers, some of them are round. Some of them are more complex, some of them are easier. A signal propagates through a network in such a way that each neuron adds up the weighted outputs of the previous neurons, normalizes that sum, and then makes the result available to subsequent neurons. And this leads me to the following simplification. An artificial neural network is a calculator that can only add, multiply, and normalize. Here's a diagram of such a calculator in action. Presumably, this network takes in an image broken into pixels and eventually classifies the subject of the image as a dog. How does it do that? I wouldn't know. Once the network has learned, I could analyze the weights matrix for principal components or clusters. But it's highly unlikely that whatever I will find, if I find anything, would be as clear cut as this diagram suggests. And if you talk to computer vision people, then identifying a dog in an image is certainly a lot harder than going through a series of well-defined steps of additions and multiplications. So artificial intelligence is somewhat like it seems to work, but I can't really explain it. We're building systems that solve tasks within models we give them in such a way that we no longer understand how they do it. But as I said, I won't be touching upon the ethical implications of this, for instance, when such networks decide your home loan applications or your parole. 
the person who built this neural network designed it for a very specific task and used their own preconceptions in approaching the problem. This is considered a top-down approach. You take a problem and you work your way down from it, you're inadvertently introducing bias in doing so. Here the implementer hard-coded a couple of assumptions about the problem space into the network. For instance, they chose a pixel representation for the image. They figured that five layers would do the job, or 500. Deep learning is all about thousands of these layers. They placed six neurons at each layer, or 60,000. You get the point. They opted for backpropagation as the learning algorithm, and then they assigned meanings to the output neurons. So the second output neuron in this diagram corresponds to the concept of a dog. Are the first and third neurons correspondence of cats and birds? What would happen if I showed that neural network an image of a wombat? And these are just some of the assumptions that the designer has made which determine the behavior and ultimately limit the capabilities of this network. See, this is one of the core problems of any approach that operates on a model. And neural networks are just that. They operate within the limits of the model the designer chose, and the number of possibilities they search through is finite. If a neural network composed a piece of music that sounded better than Bach, then it would have done so not for the love of music, but because it arranged the instruments and the notes it was given by the designer in such a way that the designer gave it positive feedback. The network wouldn't dream about lacing piano strings with kitchen forks or snipping it, the fingers it doesn't have to the rhythm of the music. Not that Bach would have done that, but I think you get the point. So why the hype? Why is everybody talking about machine learning and AI with such urgency, when in fact they are just solving problems in the way that we told them to solve them while we are giving away responsibility because we no longer understand what's actually happening? For sure, since the AI winter, the field has moved on. The algorithms have been optimized. Promising new topologies have been developed such as generative adversarial networks, which are basically two networks that are trying to outsmart each other. Jay was talking about those in her talk yesterday. And hey, Jay also raved about how easy it was to get into machine learning nowadays, because there are open source libraries available. And you can touch them. You can do stuff with them. Very importantly, too, we have cooler names. Deep learning sounds better than feed forward, OK? Deep learning is also different from feed forward because we're no longer dealing with three layers, but we're dealing with 5,000 or 50,000. And that actually touches upon the, probably the real reason why there is such a hype about machine learning and neural networks nowadays, because we now have the machines that can operate such complex networks. And if you don't believe me, then take it from someone credible. Russell is unfortunately not with us today, but I feel exactly the same way. 42-year-old me, which is 21-year-old me, hadn't been talked into doing a PhD in AI and machine learning. I'd really like to be excited about all the AI ML work that is going on at the moment, but all I'm seeing is the same problems and mistakes of 20 years ago, but with more CPU resources. <laughs> There's no doubt that people have been leveraging these ooms to push artificial neural networks into domains that were previously unimaginable. This is the GAN dissector recent work done at MIT. It gives the appearance that the neural network has an understanding of concepts such as trees and domes and clouds and doors. And I mean, look at it. It's pretty amazing. But would you consider this intelligent? Would that network ever get bored and introduce elephants, or spaceships, or decide to make music instead? The MIT network's concept of a tree, it's called a symbol, does not extend beyond its visual features. This network has never climbed a tree or heard a branch break. It has never seen a tree sway in the wind. It doesn't know that a tree has roots, nor that it converts carbon dioxide into oxygen. It doesn't know that trees can't move, and when the leaves have fallen off in winter, it won't recognize the tree as the same one because it cannot 
um, conclude that the tree is still in the same position and therefore must be the same tree. Similarly, our dog classifier won't ever hear a dog bark or see a wagging tail. The symbols that are being used here are grounded in the implementer's perception, not in the perception of the network. Consider what would be different if the dog classifier had been implemented by a person who was blind. So let's do a little experiment. Imagine training a network to count numbers in visual input. Think about that for a second. How would you design such an algorithm? What assumptions are you hard coding? And then tell me how many numbers do you see? What's relevant? Who gets to decide what is relevant? If a neural network was tra trained to give you shopping rep recommendations based on the big data available in your customer profile, would you feed it local weather data, the time of the day, the result of the last All Blacks game? Because I can tell you that actually influences Kiwi purchasing decisions. Who decides that? A famous story about early neural networks goes like this. The military trained a neural network to identify enemy bases in satellite imagery. And the network learned that task with astonishing accuracy. But when put to use, it completely failed. So when they figured out why that happened, it was because during the training on all of the images that had enemy bases, there were also clouds. That story is an urban legend. But the point is real. Here on the right, you see a picture, an image depicting a famous experiment by Daniel Dennett called the frame problem. It's about a robot whose task it is to go into a room and obtain a battery, but there's a bomb in the room. The bomb and the battery on a trolley together, the robot goes in, and in pretty much all of the cases of this thought experiment, the robot blows up as it tries to figure out whether it's relevant that the walls have been painted blue, that there are no windows, that the trolley has four wheels, that, and so on. What is relevant, and who gets to decide that? I could go on for a while, but I think at this point it is best to summarize that artificial neural networks, and in fact any algorithm that operates on a model is limited to that model, as well as the sensors and the actuators that the designer chose to give them. Recent advances have created some impressive performances, but these solutions remain highly domain-specific. There's no creativity in these networks, unless you specifically add it to the network, but how would you code for that? There's no motivation inherent in these networks, unless you specifically add it, but how would you code for that? There's no survival instinct in these networks, unless you specifically add it, how would you code for that? So what we talked thus far was from the domain of classical AI. In the 1980s, a new field of AI research surfaced. It was then labeled new artificial intelligence. New AI takes a bottom-up approach. Rather than picking a problem and working your way down towards a solution, new AI concerned itself with bodies and behavior that would emerge out of these bodies. Human and animal behaviors, they aren't controlled by a brain and then executed by a body. The nervous system runs throughout our bodies. The nerve ends at the tip of my fingers are part of my brain. My body is my brain. And my body's morphology, the way I work, determines everything. How I learn, how I behave, and ultimately how I think. Intelligence needs a body. That's a line of thinking that has its roots in cognitive psychology, and it's been around for a long time. One of the four thinkers of this theory is Professor Dr. Rolf Pfeiffer from the University of Zurich, Switzerland. Rolf is also behind that um, RoboLaunch project, the trailer of which I borrowed from in the introduction of the talk. He's building a 
lounge, a bar in Shanghai where robots mix the drinks and then drones fly them to your table. Rolf's motto was always crazy, sexy, cool, and he's pretty much staying true to that until today. Following my undergraduate studies, I had the privilege to join his artificial intelligence laboratory in Zurich. Alongside teaching new artificial intelligence, I was among a group of researchers who built a humanoid robot with a large number of sensory freedom, uh, sorry, <laughs> degrees of freedom and sensors. We controlled this robot with an artificial neural network that didn't have a learning algorithm per se, but instead we simulated the diffusion of neurotransmitters into that neural network and thereby, thereby affected its learning. This was the day of the Pentium 4. These diffusions and the learning took days. It was really painful to find out that when you made a mistake five days into the run, but that's what it was. Eventually, that robot learned a specific task that we taught it to do, which was to take a red ball in its arm and bring it into the into center field of vision. It had learned that task, but more importantly, we then immobilized the arm. It could no longer move the arm. And yet, the robot figured out, after a while and without retraining, that it could solve the task by shifting its head and its eyes and looking at the red ball. This was such a huge surprise to us because we hadn't trained for this behavior. But we figured that the behavior came out of the morphology of that robot. Unfortunately, due to the AI winter and funding situation and also burnout, I never got to complete that work. So let's not talk about that any further and instead return to agents that interact with their environments through their own bodies. Such agents are said to be situated and embodied. So why is it considered a prerequisite to intelligence that an agent have a body? The reason is that Behavior is shaped and created through interaction with the environment. I won't have time to go into the gory details of this, but consider the human body. Children learn through interaction. In fact, many have argued that the morphology of the body has evolved accordingly. Our arms don't bend backwards. They come in. And the fact that there is an incredibly high density of nerve ends at your fingertips and also at your lips may be one of the reasons why babies bring everything to their mouth. This sort of behavior is a function of the morphology that has evolved over millions of years. Second, our bodies are wired all over. Every action creates sensory feedback. From my muscles, they can sense weight. The fact that I'm touching the carpet or that I'm getting visual input when I'm looking around the room, that I'm hearing myself talk. Everything that I do generates sensory input. And this sensory feedback generates knowledge and expectations, which influence my behavior and everything that I do. If I touch that stove and burn myself badly, I will learn that to avoid the exact same actions that led to these sensory uh, sensor. <laughs> sensory sensations, that created the sensory feedback and caused me such pain. Behavior is a function of the body. Consider Crazy Bird, which we built at the lab. This is a Lego Mindstorms robot, very early days on. Its, robots, uh, its, its motors do nothing but spin in one direction at constant speed. And yet, you can see three completely different behaviors. And these are a function of the legs and the materials we put, or they put, I'm not trying to take credit for this work, they put on the uh, feet of this robot. I really like the one at the bottom right. It kind of looks like a kiwi, <laughs> if you squint. And here's another example built at our lab. This should be sound now. Anyway, you get the idea. There's another benefit of interacting with one's environment. 
the agent no longer needs to maintain a model of this environment. MIT's Rodney Brooks, another forethinker of the new AI domain, domain, aptly coined this sentence, the world is its own best model. Rodney was also the person who um, said that, or noted that it took evolution much longer to get from the primordial soup to insects than it took it from, to get from insects to humans. And therefore we should be studying insects. And there's a lot of cool stuff and uh, very interesting questions to be asked around insects. For instance, consider the ant. The motion of an ant, ant's legs are not, is not centrally coordinated by the ant's brain. The legs are said to be loosely cu coupled processes that work together in unison to give the impression of coordinated gait because they act by themselves but communicate through the environment and as a means of being part of the same body. Check out this famous passive dynamic walker built originally at Cornell. This agent has no motors and yet it exhibits quite a convincing gait. This comes purely as a function of the fact that it swings its arms like we humans do and also that its knees don't bend forwards because if they did we couldn't walk. It also helps that it's being sent downhill because otherwise it wouldn't have any energy. So there, these are just some examples of how morphology and materials, materials have shaped behavior when these agents are interacting with the environment. There's another agent I want to show you, one who's situated in a simulation. Josh, also at our lab, used genetic algorithms to evolve a species whose survival function was essentially whether it managed to push the block. And you can see how the morphology of the agent adapts to the task. But the important point about this work in the context of what I'm trying to tell you is that the agent operates within an environment, even though this is a simulation, rather than on a model of the environment. Josh specifically did not design a structure to accomplish the task, but he created an environment from which this behavior could emerge. And I wish I could talk about new AI a lot more. But at this point in time, I feel like I should return to the topic of my talk, which is jobs. But if I've piqued your interest, let me uh, point you to this book written by Rolf and Josh, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. And I can wholeheartedly recommend that. I'll also be available afterwards. I'd love to talk about this stuff, so come and find me. But let's spend the remaining minutes talking about implications on the future of work, of the stuff that I've shown you. Modern machine learning algorithms are already everywhere. They guide the information we are exposed to, how we shop, the routes we travel, etc. All of these applications have in common that they operate within models on highly specific tasks, which are highly repetitive. Those tasks have never, or at least for a very long time, not been done by humans. The questions that the question that concerns the media and the wider public is how and when machine learning will impede upon the jobs currently performed by trained humans. One aspect that is generally disregarded in this course on this matter is that humans at work typically do a whole variety of tasks and automating one or two of those won't make the job go away. Instead, machines can empower those people to be more effective with their time. Humans are excellent at connecting threads to solve problems we have previously not encountered. We are creative. We are ingenious. We think along. And if you get your culture right, employees are your best assets. Their loyalty protects and enhances your business. Machine learning algorithms, on the other hand, they only work in the presence of big data. They need vast volumes of data to make generalizations and predictions, and that already limits the set of jobs that machines could potentially take away from us. But even then, machines need to be built. They need to be taught by humans, and at the very least, this means a shift in the jobs market as automation requires skill transfer. And once the skills have been transferred, it's hard to imagine tasks we'd happily leave up to these machines without supervision. <laughs> I, 
I also had a lot of fun preparing this talk. <laughs> Rather than the robots replacing us, I consider it more likely that humans will enlist the machines to help us, to augment our intelligence. We aren't exactly good with big data or repetitive tasks, and machines can help. Here are some ideas. Automated consumer rights platforms, that's already a thing. A second opinion on the diagnosis of diseases. A machine learning algorithm has been trained with far higher accuracy to diagnose skin cancer than all of the doctors combined, basically. Now, would you let that machine diagnose and treat your cancer if you had it? Probably not. But that machine can help the doctor to make a better diagnosis and suggest better treatment. Assistive technology. Imagine adding machine learning to the superhumans that John showed us yesterday. Personal assistants run locally, of course. We live in a world where data is everywhere and we have to wade through such vast quantities thereof. Let's train machines on our own choices and our own preferences so they can help us pick from the data what is relevant to us. Translations, already a thing. Pharma research. Let machine learning test billions of molecules for the desired effect, rather than relying on the intuition of scientists doing it one by one. Software design. Hey, proof of work in the blockchain was designed by humans and it's crap. <laughs> and AI might be better to create a consensus algorithm that doesn't eat the planet. And there's a spectacular instance of intelligence augmentation that's taken place in the recent past. Who here is familiar with Move 37? Quick show of hands. One. All right, then. Move 37 was a superhuman move by AlphaGo in the second match in the series in which the machine finally defeated world champion Go player Lee Sido. The critics worldwide were in agreement that no human would have ever or has ever played this move at this time of the game. And yet, it is generally agreed that that was the move that tipped over the game and brought the AI the win. And now this move has entered history books. A machine has taught humans something about our game that we didn't know, and now human players are playing that move. In an ideal world, the shift to machines will reduce the amount of labor work we have to do either by assisting us or by taking the repetitive, high data volume tasks off of our shoulders. This will free up our time for tasks that humans are better at because we are human. And being human is something that we enjoy. Okay, there's no denying that humans enjoy maths as well. I mean, who am I talking to? But we love being human. We care. We empathize. We congregate. Hi, LCA. We develop our communities in such a way to be more inclusive and let more people be human with each other. One of the trends at the workplace is well-being, and companies do not invest in well-being because they want to protect their employees from being replaced by machines. No, on the contrary, they invest in their people so that they can be human and ultimately perform better at tasks that only humans can do because they require emotional intelligence. But a large number of companies do not treat their employees like humans. They enslave them. They rob people of their perspective and make them dependent. I don't have data to back up the following claim, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was those people, the wage slaves, that were chiefly worrying about their jobs, looking at the advancements that we're seeing in technology today. These companies out there are already treating their employees like robots. And even though this industrial revolution will create a whole slew of new jobs, those wage slaves do not have the means to prepare themselves for that shift or to make the switch. The irony is that the economic incentives would have it that these low wage jobs are going to be the last to get replaced by robots because it'll be cheaper for a long time to keep paying humans less than they're worth 
than to invest into robots that will take over their jobs. So there's this opinion piece that I saw in preparation of this talk in August in the New York Times. And while I don't necessarily agree with all the points the author makes, the gist is real. And the main message I want to leave you with today is that it won't be the robots taking away our jobs. It'll be companies replacing humans with machines and policymakers failing to prevent that as they bow to capitalism. Unless we don't let this happen. And we must not let the future of work be decided by white men in suits. We have to assume responsibility. We have to keep fighting for minimum wage and equal pay so that the wage slaves can free themselves from being treated like robots. Let's build unions. Let's help each other learn. Let's put our ethics to work in our jobs and with our consumer dollars. Let's enable each other to be human and to enjoy what we do always because humans are awesome. We are awesome. Namihi mahana motokoto fakarongo norera tenakoto 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 katoa. I'm going to go here first because uh, it's closer. <laughs> uh, first, thanks for a very, very uh, thought-provoking talk. That was really good. Um, I'm curious, like projecting out 20, 50 years when the, in the height of machine learning in 20, 50 years have these robot bodies that they know how to use, aren't they going to continue to encroach on more and more jobs and be incentivized to continue to do that? I knew that that question was coming. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, I don't want to be standing here being the grumpy old man and saying that this is never going to happen because all this newfangled stuff doesn't, you know, I don't like it. Um, I personally don't believe that we are going to be building those machines that will simply become more humanoid and encroach on our jobs, at, even at faster rates when, when Moore's Law is turning in computers even faster, and so on and so forth. But there is, as, as I said, you know, when, when bodies can build themselves, can evolve, and behavior can emerge out of these bodies, um, then that's certainly a possibility. So it's, for me, it's really a question about material science. As soon as we get to the point where materials can actually create themselves and evolve, then I think we'll have another think about this but I don't think it can be human designed. And, you know, that's my opinion, and I know it's, I can't really back it up, and I don't know what the future will bring. Oh, very nice talk, thank you. So a uh, question is that the, uh, you show a lot of dumb robot there, and also already some fancy robot working in the factory, which the grouped together inside a zoo, and now it's like, for example, self-driving car, we can like, let those robots can like, out of the zoo get in our society now. And uh, how can we make the mission critical? And uh, when the robot fall, how can we make sure the robot won't fall on a children? How can we make sure the car stop before hitting a people, although they have been successfully killed a few people now? so. What do you think about how we handle this case from our society perspective? Yeah. Excellent question. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I said I'm not going to be talking about ethics. Um, <laughs> but Paul Fenwick has done a talk in LCA 2016, I think, on the ethics of robots. And I can wholeheartedly recommend that. But it is a much, much larger discussion that we as a society need to have. And there are not going to be any easy answers, I can tell you that. But yeah, um, I mean, let's have a, you know, an ethics standard that says that we must always drive over the old people and to spare the children. And then, uh, you know, I'm just going to, because I'm better than the rest of 
people, I'm going to take my money and I'm going to ha pay a hacker to change that and so that my car plows through everything and pre preserves my life, you know? And it, it's just, it's not going to be that easy. Sorry. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, but the the uh, opening promise uh, was Industry 4.0 with uh, pictures of robotic arms. Um, are you aware of any uh, advancements of um, AI, uh, deep learning, various buzzwords into the manufacturing industries? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there there's a lot of great stuff happening. And for instance, analytics in the uh, industry, um, trying to predict when machines will fail and all this kind of stuff, it's happening. And it's great, but, you know, these are specific these are machines trained for a specific task where they are unarguably better than humans because they have much more data available to them. Um, that will, I, I can't imagine an industry where there's a human looking at a joint the entire day and trying to predict when that joint will fail. So maybe that's part of your quality assurance job and that part is going to be taken away from you, but your job will stay and the knowledge about the industry will stay. But as I, as I also said, you know, of course there's going to be a shift. The wage slaves are going to suffer. AI could even, will probably further the divide between rich and poor unless we do something about it properly. Of course, jobs will go and new jobs will get created just like the last three industrial revolutions have, do <coughs> have done to us. But we survived that and arguably the quality of life has increased for everyone now, I realize I'm you know, putting myself out here and you can attack me and, and, and say that this is not true and this and that, and we can argue about this forever. There are no easy answers. But uh, machine learning has its applications in industry and it's making, making everything better and safer and hopefully enables humans to be more human and do more of the tasks that we're good at, caring for each other, learning, and so on. So, Martin, thanks very much for all that food for thought over here. Thanks for all that food for thought. Um, I'm just wondering if you would hazard a guess um, as to whether you think that general artificial intelligence will be achieved on purpose by humans or accidentally. Um, no, it won't be. And the reason, is, the reason is the following. Because humans are not generally intelligent. <laughs> Okay, let me rephrase that, yeah? Um, <laughs> humans do not possess what is called general intelligence. Um, we are a pretty specific uh, creature made for, okay, not, not so specific tasks as this quote would have it, right? Um, but we are definitely not a general AI, and, or a general I. And so somehow my logical brain leads me to think that if we aren't one, we can't build one. That sort of thing. I also don't, I kind of, I mean, a general AI, would that be, would it have sensors on other planets? Would it, would it be, live outside the universe? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a, that's a purely theoretical concept. And we'll always have domain-specific intelligences. The question for me is whether we're operating within the model or whether the behavior is emergent from the body. Martin, Nicholas here. Uh, thanks. Uh, following the line of uh, slightly sarcastic observations, um, you characterize the hype in a very, very well. I mean, I wonder why do we need, or why not very, why do we need words and believe into AI will save our lives and this and that as humans? which is becoming, in this world of fake news, is becoming even dangerous. And we shouldn't be doing something, we as a community, because these buzzwords create awareness in policymakers. And policymakers dictate policy and create things that us, later, cannot change so easily. So we realize, OK, this is happening, and we are sarcastic about it. Shouldn't we take a more direct action in some way? It's just Asking for opinion. Absolutely. Um, yeah, if, if you can join an ethical committee and if you can influence your, influence your employer to um, make more informed choices about 
the future of work, absolutely, you should be doing that. Um, I, I can, you know, standing here in front of you and having a little bit of sarcasm, I think adds to the point, you know, I'm kind of, I mean, part of the reason why I did that was because I wanted to underline the urgency of the matter. So I completely agree with what you said. We should, we will have to. That was absolutely fantastic. Give him big, one big round of applause to finish. Before you all run off,